who are capable to listen to one more presentation. This is the last presentation, and it's in the Debian Outreach track. And um, I'm happy to once, and once again welcome uh, Andy uh, to the talk that he will be given. Andy is working with um, O'Reilly, and he has the honor of having published the first book on Linux with that uh, publishing company. So that's amazing. That's a long time ago, if I remember. 1994. And he is also very much interested in the relationship between open source and open and the openness of governments. Um, I'm not quite sure if that is the topic of this talk, but uh, I'm sure you will enlighten us anyway. Okay. Um, applause for Andy Oran. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't want to um, give you a big PowerPoint extravaganza at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Nobody wants to deal with that. I'm not going to overwhelm you with the statistics and stuff about floss manuals. And in fact, I just see a few segments of floss manuals. And I'm going to talk about what I know. Um, we have one other person here, Mushan, who has done a lot with floss manuals. I invited a lot of people, and some people said they could come, and then they couldn't come, and it's too bad. I wanted to have a panel. But we'll talk about what we can talk about. Um, this is what floss manuals looks like. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to go over what we have. We have a little bit of um, sort of, I don't know what that is on the left. Here we have a big list of manuals. I believe all the manuals are here. You will notice that a lot of things are on end user tools. They don't tend to have things like uh, GNU, uh, GNU C uh, compiler manual, that kind of thing. It's more like the Audacity manual, the Inkscape manual, a lot of things that are for artists and creative people, which shows you the origins of Floss manual. On the right are some of the more popular or recent things, like Civi CRM is in here, which I, I worked a lot on that one. I can't find it now. There is one big element that you see on a lot of web pages that is missing from this page. Anybody, of course, you're all, this is not so common for you in the free software community, but there is one big element. When you go to a lot of web pages, you see it, but it's not here. What do you think? Login? Uh, actually, there is a login, but you have to go to another place, you have to go to the right page, the WH. You, you can log in. It is a wiki, so you can log in and change it just like Wikipedia. So, but there's another element that's missing. Anybody else want to think of what I'm thinking of? Ads, yes, no ads. Um, this is basically grant supported. I don't know how the founder, Adam Hyde, can do it, but he got a grant very early in the process to set this up. He has money to pay himself to fly around the world doing his work on this stuff, which I'll describe later. He has money for two programmers, and I don't even know if they are full-time programmers, but they're doing this great work creating a whole new look that's going to be much nicer. Uh, they, they call it bookie because it's like wiki, but it's more for a book. So this is a, and there is the login here, except I'm already logged in. So uh, Floss Manuals is free software. Let's see, the slogan is free manuals for free software. And it was started by Adam Hyde, who was sort of an artist. He's an installation artist and has done some radio work. So he comes from the art community, and a lot of people he got interested in this beforehand also came from the art community. And I think you can see that in a lot of things about it. You can see it in the aesthetics, which are, let's not try to do things perfectly, but let's just get something out there and see what it looks like. And you can see it, as I um, showed you before, in the list of topics. And then we have... Oh, Wikimedia Commons, Alchemy, WordPress, mPlayer, and so forth. Um, and he just got a bunch of people to start writing. The first minute, I think I'll go to my slides here. I did prepare a few slides, nothing too heavy. And the very first one they did was called Audacity. It's about the, uh, the audio editing tool. Um, and this is the old look. It's, it's not great, but it's good enough. And there was a lot about this that was good enough. The editing interface, which I could show you, is just like what you see on a lot of blog sites when you put in comments. It has a WYSIWYG interface. You can do bold and italic, and you can do some indents. Pretty simple stuff. And the way it looks is good enough. And the IRC channel, which I could show you if you like, is, is good enough. It's uh, this little... Um, box where you can watch what other people are doing when you are editing and you can have a quick exchange of comments with someone if you both happen to be online at the same time. And translations, oops, I didn't mean to do that, I meant to do the next slide. Uh, this is the Hindi version of the Audacity manual. Translations are a big part of it. They are all volunteer, everything is volunteer except for the couple of programmers that they've hired to make the new system. Here's another manual that interests many people. 
This has, besides a Farsi translation, a Chinese and a Russian translation, they're doing some others. There are many sites, which I'll get to. I lied about the statistics. I did want to impress you that there's a lot of people involved. The regular users, I'm not sure what that means. I think it's better than just people with accounts because, you know, Facebook has 800 million people on their account, right? So the regular users is something. All these other things mean something. I actually think that the request change tickets, that's a very low number. But that's what I saw when I looked at their, uh, their bug reporting site. And uh, 50 manuals in English. Here are some of the translation sites. As you can see, some people have actually set up entirely their, their sites at particular countries for their translations. Sprints is a very interesting and uh, it's sort of something that came later after Floss Manual started. Uh, Adam had heard about code sprints and there was someone who had talked to him about the possibility of doing book sprints and he thought, why don't we just get people together and have them work eight hours a day or so for five days and see what comes out. And it's, it's been really amazing and people can do a lot. In fact, I've gone to my company, O'Reilly, and said maybe we should have people do books this way. Because the typical way of doing a book, I can tell you working at a publisher, is you sign a contract with somebody who is already a big shot. And they have a job, and they're probably doing training and consulting, and they may have a family and so forth. And they're wrenching three or four hours a week out of their schedule and always putting things aside and making excuses to people and then making excuses to their editor because they can't get things done fast enough. And it's really agony. And it might be actually better for them just to say, get the babysitter. I'm going to take a week or two vacation from work. I'm going to say goodbye to my family for just a week or two and go off and do it, especially if you had a few people collaborating. And you could come out with a book, perhaps, in that time. Uh, but one of the problems with doing that is that commercial books usually have to be a certain size. If they're under, say, 200 pages, it, it's not very easy to sell it and make money on it, just the, the, the whole print aspects. It might work better with electronic books. And I tend to notice that the things produced by these sprints are anywhere from 75 pages to 150. Um, I worked on one, the Civi CRM manual, that was like 150 the first time around, and then the second edition we got up to over 300. So it is possible to, to do it incrementally and make it better and better. But it's an amazing experience doing a sprint. You get in a room with people, you're, you're chatting, you're working together. Well, you've probably done this in other context. And um, it's really nice to do something that's really creative, like writing um, as a sprint. You certainly want people who know their stuff who come in having done the research, having done the basic things they need to do already. But it's a wonderful way to build community and it creates this center for things to, fo people can focus on this thing this, while they're doing it and afterward. This is our book, we did this. And it can, it's, it's something that you don't get just by working on a wiki. And I noticed that um, either tomorrow or the next day, there's gonna be some talk about the Debian wiki. And so wikis can be pretty neat, but it's, it's really something to do a book, and it's really amazing to do a book in a short period of time. And Mushon did one on Collaborative Futures, which as you mentioned before. And I think I might have another slide somewhere. That was all I had for slides. Um, the software I'll talk a little bit about. It is based right now on TWiki. Where's the thing? And it's okay. As I said, it's good enough. Um, TWiki uh, has some limitations. I think it has limitations on the the output on uh, producing a, a nice output with a lot of interesting CSS properties and probably some uh, uh, problems with the input as well. So the um, Adam Hyde, who as I said founded the project and a uh, couple of the people he hired decided to throw everything out and just take uh, Django and create a new interface from scratch, which is what they're doing. Um, and it's, they've got some pretty grandiose plans. Right now all you can do is produce a PDF, which I think I have over here. This is a, a sample of what it looks like. Uh, we have something much better now. Unfortunately, I didn't save the screenshot of uh, what it looks like with really nice fonts and a much better layout. But they're trying to make it look like a really good professional book. And, um, and I think they've gotten pretty close. So you can produce a PDF, but they want to be able to import lots of things, export lots of things. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah. We should get the um, microphone. Oh, this. See whether it's on. and. See. Uh, I think the problem is that the battery's uh, dead, and so it it flashes and then it stops. Okay, so I'll repeat the uh, the gist of what you say. Yeah. So I guess uh, I'm really curious to know if it's on. Wow, it's on. Thank you. Yeah. You rule. 
Good. Um, yeah, I guess. So I, in, I've sort of, I feel like in my life I've moved away from using technical reference books toward mm. just when I have a problem searching for a solution. And I guess I'm wondering how, um, wh what you guys have thought about in terms of if, you know, what users you're targeting with these books and if you've got any feedback on if they solve their problems and how you, how you chose books as opposed to like some other kind of writing. And that reminds me that I didn't tell you anything about the read, write, and remix interface, which I should do. Uh, I was rather surprised, too, when Adam contacted me. My own way of getting involved was that I have been very concerned about books maybe being irrelevant or not, not meeting everyone's needs because information moves so fast. And so I have written a bunch of articles about how experts who are normally asked to write books for publishers, experts could collaborate with people online doing wikis, even doing mailing lists and forums, uh, try to find ways to bridge these things so that you have the instant instantaneousness and the community aspects of you know, all the benefits that has, along with the benefits of having experts who sit back and take time to think about it and put out a great statement. So I wrote some articles and Adam contacted me and asked me to be on his advisory board and then I did some volunteering and yeah, I went to a conference where I met Biela Coleman and that's how I got involved in this Deviant conference and so forth. Uh, so it seems that people still want a, an authoritative source and there are times when they just get frustrated trying to get their information in bits and pieces. Uh, I think it, it really you can do it for a certain amount of time and there's some people who boast about never having read a book or not reading a book about something. I think um, a lot of people say, I really need to get my head around it this time. And say in CIVI CRM, which is one of the things I worked on, say, well, we can tag things just like in Facebook or Dig, you can tag things. And, and there's tags and there's other things that look similar and I don't quite get the difference and when do I use one, when do I use the other? And eventually they say, I really want to get my head around it. So a book will be useful for that. And they might not read the whole 350 pages, which is now the size of the CIVI CRM manual. Uh, but um, at least it, it is there organized. I know the way I've read manuals, um, I, I sometimes read cover to cover, which is of course the right way to do it. You know, I want you to read the whole thing, but uh, sometimes I'm in a hurry, so I'll go look for an example. And I'll say, oh yeah, let's try this. That doesn't work, so I'll back up 10 pages and see what it says about the example and try it again. That doesn't work, I back up another. And you can do that in this book, but it's nice to have a book that's well organized, so even if you're reading in that kind of you know, um, dyslexic way, you can, you can still get uh, a continuity and a narrative from it. So having answered that, let me talk a bit about this read, write, remix. Read is just a website. So you get the canonical information. I think here they solve some of the problems that you worry about with other wikis when you worry that people are going to just, maybe with the best of intentions, people are going to put in incorrect information and try to update something without really understanding it. So the read site has been validated by someone. There are certain maintainers although we were just trying something before where I published a new version inadvertently. So uh, I suppose uh, it's, maybe it's not as secure as it should be. The idea is that the maintainers look at, um, every couple months they can look at the wiki part, see whether it's good, make sure it's good, then they publish it. Now if there's new stuff that you're looking for, you can go to the write part. And uh, write means uh, if you uh, log in, you can um, add stuff, you can change stuff. And you can also see what other people have done, and it's raw. It's more like Wikipedia, where you just get what's there that day. And remix, I'm not sure how much people are using it, but it just means you can take different chapters from different manuals. The granularity is one chapter. And also for editing, the granularity is one chapter. You can't have two people editing the same chapter at the same time. Uh, but remix could be very useful, say, for people who want to do textbooks and want to take one thing from here, one thing from there. Um, yes? So um, one of the projects I work on is the OpenAFS project, for, which is a distributed network file system that originally began uh, as, an, as a, uh, well, it began as a CMU project, but it became a commercial product from Transarc, which was purchased by IBM, mm -hmm. that they then open sourced. So one of the things that's a little bit unique about it compared to a lot of open source projects is that we got it as an open source project um, with, with a complete, um, both not, not only a complete reference manual, but a complete user manual written by professional documentation writers at IBM. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that, that one of the things that about this present about the presentation about having a website like this 
Um, and having a set of manuals like this that brings to mind or the, the sort of combination blessing and a curse that we ran into with having this in an open source project. We have this, this large manual, which was clearly written with a consistent, a, to a consistent style guideline mm -hmm. and with a whole set of conventions. Um, and then we have an open source project, which uh, being the open sourcing of a commercial application that had stagnated for years before it was open sourced, <laughs> immediately after it, became an after it became open source, changed drastically, quickly, mm -hmm. because all this pent up demand and all these pent up patches that everybody had flowed into the tree. Um, what happened in practice was is that the, the manual and even though it was even in the same project, it, and these are, these are kind of a separate website from the project, um, became very quickly rather significantly out of date and then became extremely intimidating. And so we had this problem where how do we get back to having a well-written manual when we have this sort of extremely well-written but wrong manual mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> You know, can you set guidelines that say that we can't, you're not allowed to change something in the source from this point on without also updating the manual? Uh, and then you get into a whole bunch of questions around who you can ask to update the manual and that sort of thing. And I think that's one of the things, to me, that's a challenge for open source manuals because open source changes. Commercial products, they release a commercial product, you write a manual for that product. It, it, it's going to change eventually, but the, mm -hmm. th that product has a lifespan, and over that lifespan, it's not really going to change very much. I know in the Civic CRM manual, uh, we deliberately decided not to try to go into great detail about which menu you use for which thing and how to do, uh, say, how to get your mail server to work with other, you know, with, with say, spam filtering and stuff. All those details were still on the wiki, and the book was more of a conceptual book. How do you think about tags, as I mentioned before? How does tags compare to other things, and how do you plan ahead before you put your data into CVCRM so that you can use all these features? So that was it's meant to be a more stable kind of information. And, um, and you know, it gets out of date fairly quickly. Uh, that uh, AFS situation is a very interesting one where you had a manual. Uh, I haven't read it, so I don't know how good it is. You might think it's good on one level, but sometimes uh, if you try something totally different, you might say, wow, we really wanted this other one. We didn't realize that we were missing so much. Oh, it, I mean, it, it's, it's technical documentation. It's not mm -hmm. written as a book. So mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it, it falls short of the standards of uh, an O'Reilly book, for example, mm -hmm. in the sense that it didn't have that kind of degree of editing for mm -hmm. flow. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in the community, it's pretty well respected. The people who have gone and tried to run AFS really like the manual up until the point which it led them off a cliff because the software <laughs> <Yeah>. had changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a tough situation. And I think it's probably the same with code and with anything else in life. That you have to decide what parts you're going to keep, and sometimes it's better just to start over, but sometimes you can keep some parts. Yes. I mean, in a way, the situation you've described is that the manual has a dependency on some version of OpenAFS. Right. And that version isn't encoded necessarily in the manual, although maybe it is, I don't know. Well, I mean, we can say, we can say that it's dependent on, but it, that, that version does not look like it runs anymore. That's oh. one of the problems. I, maybe I'll just yeah. yeah. The, the problem is more that that's not the version that, that that anyone runs anymore because it's the, it's the version that was originally released open source, which at this point was 10 years ago. Um, so you know we've, we're trying to do updates to the manual. It's just that 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 a I mean, it, one of the problems that we're running into is is that if what you ask people to do is is like the kind of documentation you're talking about, go to this menu to change this thing and then move to a different menu. It's actually really easy to tell people, oh, you have to change the manual when you move the menu. That's trivial. What mm -hmm. what what actually is harder is when the conceptual is when you introduce a whole new conceptual feature to the software. Getting the person introduced to write the, who's writing the software to also write the manual entry is actually quite hard. That's the problem we've more run into. Yeah. Well, then I, I have a little trite answer for you, which is to run a book sprint. I mean, yeah. it seems like you've just got to solve it if you're going to have it solved. And after Carl talks, I'd like to put Mouchon on because he has so much that he could say about fonts and design and, and bookie, and bookie stuff. Well, I better get my question in then. Okay. Mouchon's going next. Um, uh, this is sort of a technical question. There are a lot of free books out there already in freely licensed and in free-ish formats. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular that you edited. Mm -hmm. and. Um, <laughs> Is there a way to import those into Floss Manual so that they can become part of that editing environment and sort of join the Floss Manual's community, even though they were not written in a book sprint? Well, that's part of the grandiose plans to have a lot of import and export. And DocBook, which producing open source software is in, is one of the things it's planned for. But it, it's kind of uh, it's it's a big job. So I think first they're trying to get the new software just working, have a nice interface, have a nice output PDF look, and I think the the other things are on the way. So, okay, why don't you talk about that then? Yeah. I'm done. So. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, when we worked on collaborative futures, the like co collaborative futures is a is a bit of a different um, challenge because 
collaborative futures, futures was not a manual. It was, um, we were invited by, like Floss Manuals was, was invited by uh, the Transmediale Art Festival in Berlin to, to write a book about the future of collaboration. And we didn't know anything about what this book would be other than the two words, collaborative futures. And it's not a manual book, so there's not like, l l like in the case of, uh, of that I just talked about with design, it's, 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 it's not like there's this object that we respond to. That there's more like pe different people thinking about different things and, and responding to it. Now, now it was the first time uh, we Bookie was used. It was like pre-alpha, basically. <laughs> it was crashing all the time and everything as you would expect. Uh, but, but the nice thing is that it's all, like the, the syntax is all HTML. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a um, uh, smart um, kind of WYSIWYG editor. So wh every time uh, Bookie would crash, we would just revert to some other uh, editor. I worked on, on a WordPress editor <laughs> and, and just copy pasted directly into Bookie and everything worked. So, so again, a matter of, of open standards and the open standard is HTML. Um, do, do you want me to actually show Bookie? That would be nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll look at. Uh, do you want to? Can you do it here? Or do you want to pull yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. I can do it on your computer. All right. Um, and uh, and as, as we're doing that, I'll just respond to to your question yeah. about uh, uh, about um, Emmanuel. I, I agree with you. I, I if I have a, a bug or something, or I'm I'm searching for for it online, and I rarely come I, I get, get a, a response of the book. Um, I'm, it's usually a blog post, but um, what, what is happening with these books is that the fact that it's, it is a centralized artifact, which is kind of the opposite of w many of the things that we're doing, it, it's, it's like this conference. This conference is a centralized artifact. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so people get excited about, about being a part of this. It, the same way that people get excited uh, about writing a book, because we, we come together, we work together, and we come up with a product. And that product is, uh, like, we wouldn't have invested so much time and so much uh, focused collaboration on, on writing a manual. That manual is available as HTML online. And it has been thought about by different, uh, by different people. And that's basically, a book is a good excuse for collaboration. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, uh, one of the great uh, uh, strengths of, uh, of Floss Manual. Um, this, is, uh, this doesn't bode well. I don't know whether we should blame the Columbian network or the bookie site for the um, long loading. <coughs> so, yeah. Oh, so it's, uh, it's just loading. I, I pressed on this. This is yeah. core components of that, what you want. And <laughs> so let's just try. Yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> now, I, I should mention, of course, that a lot of projects are funded. I believe. Um, who funded the Collaborative Futures? Uh, uh, so. Well, the Transmedia Festival tr funded the, the Collaborative yeah. Futures, the, the first Collaborative Futures mm -hmm. sprint, and then the second one was, uh, was funded by, um, the, the, the second sprint was f funded, sorry about your Facebook here. Don't All right. look. <laughs> um, um, fu oh, it's down. Yeah, it, oh, it's, I think it's, it's, actually, okay. it's actually going through oh. an upgrade right now. Okay. So we won't be able to show you that, um, but, yeah, but, but, but the, the point is that for, for, for the case of, the, um, of I, I'm, I'm really interested, I, my, my background is in design and I've, I've been doing print design much before I've been doing web design and much, I guess, before there was web design. Um, and, and, and to be able to control the book through, through the same language that I control CSS and to collaborate uh, around that is, is awesome. And, and the book is designed with CSS and Actually, at, at, the, at the moment, uh, Floss Manuals is, um, is trying to contribute back to, to Firefox to implement uh, CSS3 uh, standards that are not implemented yet that are about printing. Be because, because Floss Manuals is in the cutting edge of, of using web technology for, for print. Are you saying that the PDF style is encoded using CSS? The, the CSS, uh, yeah, the, it outputs uh, PDF, it outputs uh, EPUB, uh, it outputs HTML. So every, everything that is written for the book is also available um, as HTML and is searchable and so on. And then, if, again, it's, a, it's an excuse to create the content. The, the book a, as itself, um, it's great to have on, uh, I, I, um, 
to, it's great to hold, but even if you're, I, I, even if you're actually, if you actually have the book, you can search it. You can still search it online, mm -hmm. and then oh, it's it's down there in this episode, in, in this <coughs> chapter. Oh, it's all right. It's going fine. Oh, thanks. So um, it's sort of the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Do we have any stats or data about the, the number and demographics of people who are reading the manuals? Well, except for that, Adam said the brief message saying he has 2,200 <laughs> regular users, and I don't know what that means. It would be great to get um, downloads. I think someone asked me earlier today, suppose you wrote a book and you'd like to know how many people downloaded it. Yes, they should be giving you that information. Um, I haven't seen anything like that, except once in a while someone will say, hey, you know, we did this, uh, somebody wrote this great blog or we got on Slashdot or something and we had a spike in usage, you know, but uh, we should be reporting this more regularly. I like that. Yeah, that would be really useful. Uh, on my laptop, there's, uh, which I'm going to get to real soon now, but it's in a Git repository on my laptop right now, it's a project I'm thinking of called uh, Debian TFM, because, you know, they always say RTFM, but yeah. there isn't really an effing M mm -hmm. for Debian. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something it was going to be, it's all in DocBook, GPL'd, and mm -hmm. it was going to be like one of the typical uh, you were certainly, operating You're certainly a level. trooper to be doing it in DocBook, I think. Uh, operating yeah. system uh, mm -hmm. type books that okay. you see in Barnes mm -hmm. and Nobles or Borders. Yeah. But my thing is that m I, I don't really need help with the writing, but the other aspects of producing a book, the design, the editing, and so on, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that's not skills that I really have. So is that something that Floss Manuals could help with? As far as I know, well, certainly editing is done in various ways. I'm a professional editor. So I've donated some time, and I've been paid for some of my time to work on some of these things. Um, I'm talking about commas, and semicolons, and things. Well, more than that, uh, developmental stuff. Like stuff. That. There are people who will go through. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have as good a command as, you, as they think they do of uh, good English syntax, whether it's no. British English or American English. But there are people who will go through, and they'll do a pretty good job. I said everything about Floss Manuals is pretty good or good enough. So yes, there are people who will do that. Um, and um, as for design, I guess we basically have a standard design, right? And the standard design can change, but I don't think you would um, probably tweak too many elements of it. You would probably use the same design as the other books, I think. Well, actually, I, d I did want to ask uh, one more like follow-up uh, mm -hmm. to that. Is also, could you comment on um, uh, getting Floss manuals, you know, from whatever source into bookstores? Because I think mm. that's, that's vital, because a lot of people can read mm -hmm. stuff online, but there's a lot of people who don't. Yeah, ask O'Reilly how to get books in the bookstores. That can be <laughs> hard enough. You go to the bookstores. Well, um, I believe that Floss Manuals could. I, I don't think they have any connection with the booksellers like Amazon.com now, but they certainly can put ISBNs on books. Do we have ISBNs now? Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. so getting, getting an ISBN is really easy, and it's cheap. It's like $25. And we have... We actually, it was cheap enough for us to get different ISBNs for the, different, for, for the two different Collaborative Futures editions, even though there were only five months be between them. Um, but, um, and then you can actually get it on Amazon as well. So when you have an ISBN number, you can put the, y your book on Amazon. There, there's, there's a bit of a process for that, but, but it's, it's completely doable. I now, you can, you can also put it on, on lulu.com uh, or, or other print-on-demand print uh, bookstores. So, so if you're thinking about supporting the the, the production, you the, the way print on demand works and the way Lulu works, they they, they say it would cost you, um, um, let, let's say, eight dollars to pr to print a single book, um, and and then uh, if you want to pay it, if you want to sell it for twelve dollars, you, you'll get four dollars from from uh, from that from that, and it still you know it it still follows the um, all, all of the principles of, uh, of free software in that sense. Um, so 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 I think that that can be another incentive and another uh, um, a, another set of properties for um, for um, uh, collaboration in that sense. And yeah. I, I did look okay. into uh, Lulu, uh, uh, and but my concern is the same with having stuff online <laughs> that. Uh, okay. You know, um, we're, we're okay. that, you know, the people who know can get to the information. But I think a big audience nowadays for computer <coughs> books is people who are just casual <laughs> computer users. 
And the first thing they do is go down to their local borders or Barnes and Nobles and look at what's on the shelves over there. And they'll mm -hmm. see like maybe 20 Fedora books, 20 Ubuntu books. Uh, but maybe mm. like one <laughs> forlorn uh, copy of like Martin Kraft's Debian book from like three years ago. Mm. So if we really want to okay. get books, if we want to get information on Debian out there, we need mm -hmm. to get it into the bookstores as well. Along those lines, I mean, you're, I agree with you that um, it'd be really good to have people be able to stumble across this information when they walk into a bookstore. But a different thing we could do is on project websites, like the Audacity website, there could be a big button that says, like, so there's a documentation tab on the website. And there's just this enormous button that says, click, and we'll take 25 of your dollars and give you a book. And uh, like to yeah. tie it to software acquisition, especially for Windows users who don't install these things from apps. Let me see where the Civi CRM did that, because they are very proud of that book while we're talking. Uh, my question is for you. Uh, you said that you have export functionality for the uh, books. Do you, can you export currently uh, uh, in FLOSS manuals to anything besides PDF? Because like, when we tried it, we were only able to get the PDFs. Can, can you do DocBook? Can you do just HTML dumps with uh, FLOSS manuals as exist now? Or do you have, you can? Well, um, oh, by the yeah. way, Civi CRM does play up You're running a lot today. Um, like the free book. It's, uh, mm -hmm. ba basically, you can with Bookie. Bookie exports to multiple um, formats. Um, Bookie.cc does does exist. It, it is. Um, I, I I think, you know, it's public and it's usable already. Um, we, again, we used a Bookie in in its pre-alpha version. I would say it's kind of better right now, <laughs> and it's it, unlike in the first um, in in the first sprint where we where it was really crashing all the time. This time we we actually used it. It has uh, it has IRC built in. So we're chatting about the book in uh, in real time, and we're consulting about it. Like if you go and uh, and read the Collaborative Futures book, you, you'll actually see samples of our conversations, because basically we were also ex um, researching ourselves through through the writing of the book. Um, so 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 yeah, it's, it, there are uh, it, it it is usable. Um, the, you, you can you can export it to to multiple. Um, um, the versions, it's still in a lot of development right now. And, and there's still, still a lot of bugs, uh, but they are being crushed um, on a daily basis. I think yeah, the, the, there's, uh, I think it's Objavi dot, dot uh, Floss Manuals. But, but Floss Manuals is being okay. imported completely to, bo to Bookie. So I would say, I don't want to put a, a deadline, but it, it is being worked on right now, and the reason we can't access bookie.cc is because right now they're doing an upgrade, a major upgrade. Hi, I'm Maxi. Uh, uh, could you please uh, put a, a big page with the URL of the site that you're mentioning? The bookie one? Bookie.cc, which is yeah. Really, well, one yeah. that gets in the video on no spelling errors, and so, uh, so it, it's too it's 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 too yet. small for the video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So. Okay. Let's try that. All right. Let's see. It's B B O O K I dot C C. So, oh yeah. Oh, Woo! Yeah. Hey. <laughs> um. Hi. Um. I I was just wondering if if you have any uh, facilities now or, or plans in the future for. Um, some sort of uh, workflow between programmers and writers. I was just thinking of the question here from uh, our friend from AFS. You know, it sounds like one of the problems that he's facing is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have any professional writers on your staff, right? And a lot of programmers are, are not good writers or don't like to write. Um, and if, if the leap is straight from coders and now I'm gonna write a book, you maybe have a much larger leap than coders writing some sort of intermediate or using some sort of tool to prepare the um, 
to provide the basic information for collaboration with the writer. Is it, do, do you have any plans or, or I, I ideas about how that part of the process goes on to bring the, uh, for things that are about a program, uh, an application for instance, to bring the programmers into the writing process if, if they don't feel comfortable doing it themselves? That, I'm going to take that to a higher, a more meta level. There is um, an attitude in Floss Manuals of let's just throw things together and see what happens. Certainly we want the programmers on the project to be involved, to do the writing or be available. Um, pretty much like a standard tech review sort of thing. But I don't think we have too many workflows, too many processes. Adam is really kind of against that. He wants people to just sort of do, um, there are people who come along saying, let's do a big style guide and make everybody conform. And he comes, one of the few times that he came down really hard and insisted on his way of doing things was to say, I don't want people to insist on their way of doing things. Oh. And he said, it's okay to write style guides and people can look at them, but we don't enforce it. Yeah. I Yeah, you like to do. You like to have a an organized an organized way for developers. Yeah, I, I, to I wasn't thinking so much of, of the of of having an organized way for, but um, uh, people can't work in a vacuum. Um, yeah. So so suggestions or or if there is a, even if you don't have a, a set of style guides for it, is there some sort of intermediate mm -hmm. um, form between the the comments? Right and the book um, mm -hmm. that the programmers then could, in their unstructured way or structured way, produce as a to prepare for your process. I mean, mm. to prepare for. So they you know, could a use something, something like, like something like the uh, web program that um, Donald Knut designed, or, or something like Java Doc or PyDoc, and and then take the comments. Um, and, I can respond know. to that as well. Okay. Um, so um, one one thing that that is being worked on is a book for facilitating uh, book sprints. Um, and uh, so it's, it's going super meta. Um, so the, and the facilitator, like I, I was a facilitator on, on the second uh, Collaborative uh, Futures Sprint and, and, and Adam was, was the facilitator on the first one. And the facilitator has a very important role. As much as you know, horizontal and collaborative, blah blah blah, it might it, it might be. There, there are some best practices, and best practices that are based on um, you know the the floss manuals uh, experience. But but another another thing that happened is uh, the the point where I'm, I really agree with Adam uh, about let's just get something out there is that it's much easier to make something better when there's something to make better. Um, and and what happened with um, Again, what happened with collaborative, collaborative Futures is that the first book started from two words. We didn't have a, so, a software to respond to. And um, you know, the responses for, for the first editions w w w the, for the first edition was really good. But, but the second edition, uh, when, when the new authors came in the, book, in, the, in the room, they were saying like, we're not here to edit it and, and kind of fix typos and stuff. We're here to, to, to actually respond to, to a body of, uh, of work that, that has been gathered, and we actually have a lot of problems with this body of work. And, and, and Collaborative Futures not being a manual is actually, there's a lot of uh, conceptual and ide ideological um, ba um, gaps between the different authors. But, but, but the second that, that, that the authors could respond to an existing book, then, then the, the level of, of, um, of progress was m much faster. So y you need to get something down there, and then you, you can, you can um, improve on it. I can make some philosophical statements about programming and documentation. The programmer should definitely be working very closely with people who do documentation. Just as in your own talk, Mushan, you said that programmers and designers should work closely together. Now, when I was working on the Civi CRM manual, I was editing, going along, and I keep reading something that says, um, you have to have a profile to do this. So if you have not created a profile, go do that and come back. And this is happening over and over again. All these things depend on profiles. You always have to go do the profile first and come back. And I finally wrote to them and said, have you thought of making a design change so that you can just press a button and it takes you to the profile page right there? You don't have to interrupt your flow. And they said, yes, we're thinking about that. So design, you know, documentation and design really do go together. Uh, programmers should be thinking about the people they're, they're programming for all the time. That affects design, that affects documentation. And as to doing, and I know you would like to have better workflows and better ways to organize that, but that's pretty hard to organize. Yeah, I just had a question going back to what you were saying earlier about uh, design. Uh, last year I did have an opportunity to write a book, become one author on a book, only I had six weeks. 
So we were in a, we worked on it uh, eight hours a day, more than likely 12 hours a day for six weeks. So you have this idea where working on the book, you're in almost like a LaTeX interface where you're just dumping information. Mm -hmm. Then you want some style applied to it and then read not only your chapter, but other people's chapters. Because what was happening was someone would write something and then everyone else would go, oh, I'm going to keep it and that, that flow is good for me. I'll, I'll use, you're kind of not the same information, but the same layout. So is there any way in this to keep that style kind of locked to allow the, you know, just so that I can sit there and type in the information? in a LaTeX kind of way and give you the hints, but then magic happens on the back end, I, I can look at the printed page, or what would be a representation of the printed page. Do you, do you want to answer to that? Because hmm. ba basically, I think if it's about design, you'd better. better um, if, if you're talking about design as, as in, uh, do, do you mean design as in, as in graphic design? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Completely. I don't, I don't deal with that. I you don't. And, and that's, uh, that's actually one of the strengths of, uh, of Bookie. I've, I've been designing books with kind of the leading proprietary software uh, um, in the field, which is uh, InDesign. Now, InDesign is, is really based on, is, is trying to basically mimic CSS. It's, it's trying to, like, you can select text and say this is the type of text. It's like a class. Y you, can, you can say this is a heading. Like, it's really based on, uh, on, on the idea of, of CSS. And then um, it's, it's actually much easier to, to, manipulate, um, to, to manipulate the content in, in, in Bookie th than, than it is in, uh, in InDesign, no matter how advanced the, this, this software is. And it, and it is, you know, B Bookie is not there yet, but, but it, the, the inherent advantages of, of the separation of content and presentation that, that, that is what HTML and CSS are doing is, is really great. Like I, I have been, when I'm designing, when I'm working on the design for collaborative futures, I'm actually even using CSS3 um, meta se um, kind of selectors to, to actually um, break the fourth paragraph because it happened to be longer than the other. Like I, I, I can really um, do a lot of manipulation through, um, f through, through the power of CSS. So, yeah. In, in, in yeah. Um, yeah. F first of all, you can export um, from from collaborative from Bookie. You can export a, a a large array of sizes, but 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 in general, because the content itself is is HTML, and what Objavi does. Uh, Objavi is the is the engine that tra trans transforms the content into into a, a PDF or an EPUB. Um, it it basically manipulates the, this uh, this HTML and it's and it's actually using um, uh, the right now it's it's using WebKit to actually render the book and we're contem contemplating m moving to um, uh, to Gecko the, the the same engine for uh, for Firefox. Um, if if we get to implement some uh, some CSS selectors into, it. I just had a very quick question: Is XSL a, a dead end now, in, in in your opinion? Well, it's I I think I think it is, <laughs> um, because if if HTML um, can be can be as um, or even closely as selectable as XSL. Then, then we have a format that is much more adopted and, and much more readable. Because XSL is, is a nightmare to read. Um, and this is about re reading. <laughs> this is definitely about reading. So yeah, I, th I, think, I think the investment in, in HTML and in, in web technolo technology for writing books is, is the, the, right, uh, the, the right way to go, especially since one of the exports of, of the book is a web page. I think we have to wrap up. I would like to take sort of speaker's privilege to talk about one quick thing that's totally different. I have this thing called uh, Blue Hacker, bluehacker.org. I don't know if you've seen this before. It was given to me by one of my authors. One of my authors went through a terrible period of depression and nearly dropped out of working on a book, and he got involved in this organization, bluehackers.org. When he talked to me, I said, well, you know, I have family members who have dealt with depression. He said, there's a lot of people who deal with depression, and it's hard to talk about. It's one of those things that can be, you know, um, 
So it can be biologically based, but it's still hard to admit. So I wonder if you feel comfortable. How many people here have dealt with depression or have close friends or family members? Could you raise your hands if you can talk about that? So if you would like to be part of this movement, just to make people feel better, feel like there's other people who suffer with that, you can get one of these Blue Hacker stickers. And when you go to a conference and speak like I'm doing, you can bring it up. And we'll create a little movement around that. That's all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> Thank you.